Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're gonna do something that I've been wanting to do for a while now. I think I've brought it up a couple times recently, but this is gonna be an updated version of a video that I did at the very beginning of my channel back in 2021. And I did a couple additional videos, uh, probably in early 2022, but I haven't really touched it since that time. And it has everything to do with the new church symbol and the golden gate of the Temple Mount, which we're looking at right here as well as the front doors of the Salt Lake Temple. And I think the way that this got on my radar was when we had some missionaries over one time and we were having dinner with them. And one of them said that the new church symbol fits within these arches of the Golden Gate. And so I wanted to check that out and see if that was true. And I will show you right now. Let's go to Photoshop. Um, <clears throat> this is the most like straight on picture that I can find of the Golden Gate. Um, it is off a little bit. You can see the side of this tower right here. But let's zoom in a little bit. And uh, what I did is I took the church symbol and then I just overlaid it. And this is what it looks like. You see, you can see that the bottom part of the church symbol is uh, going down past, you know, this area, uh, the what would be the opening. Uh, let me take this off really quick. You can see that basically, <clears throat> excuse me, you have uh, like this bottom area right here. Like if this is like a doorway, uh, the floor would be like right here if you were to walk through. And so let me pull up this uh, line so you can see it better. Okay. So again, the church symbol does not exactly fit in there if you have this bottom part. Uh, but... If you take that off, it does. It does fit very, very well. Okay? So I thought that that was pretty interesting. And then later on, I, I can't remember how I decided to do this. I don't know if it was because of a comment or email or if I realized it myself. But uh, I wanted to look at the Salt Lake Temple and do the same thing. Okay? So, <clears throat> in fact, okay. So yeah, let's use this first. So here is, you know, a drawing of the front of the Salt Lake Temple. And you can see it has that shape of the church symbol in a bunch of different places. You have it up here, the Holiness to the Lord plaque. Uh, you also have the windows and things like that. And so let me just go ahead and pull this up. Not that one. There we go. Let's zoom in. And uh, yeah, the church symbol fits very, 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 very well in the doorway. Not exactly, though, because you'll notice <clears throat> uh, these lines, I believe, represent the steps that go up to the front uh, doorways. And so you'll notice that it doesn't fit exactly if this top line is uh, like the floor. Not exactly. But I'll show you an actual picture of the Salt Lake Temple. But while we're still here, and if we look at um, the windows and we look at the holiness to the Lord, You'll see that it doesn't fit. Um, this is, the the plaque is longer, <clears throat> or it has a greater height than the church symbol. If we look at a window right here, same thing. It doesn't quite match just the top part because the top part is essentially a circle. But uh, the one place that it does fit uh, really well uh, is the front two doors, okay? And uh, we're going to get into this whole thing. We're going we're gonna to get into the history of the Temple Mount and the, and the Golden Gate. We're also going to look at uh, the front doors of the Salt Lake Temple. Because if you haven't been there, you may not know that you don't go into the temple through those doors. They're sealed. <clears throat> and um, we're going to look into why they may be sealed. And it has to do with the Second Coming. But if we look at an actual picture of the Salt Lake Temple, um, and we do the same thing. Here you have it. It actually does fit. Uh, from what I can tell, it looks like it fits perfectly. You can see this dark line right here. Like this is uh, the floor, uh, right? The bottom of these doors, it's like right here. You see this dark line. And if we bring this back, you can see it fit. It fits right there. Um, and it seems to fit the, the doorways perfectly when you have the entire church symbol. Okay. So that's really interesting. So we have these two... 
uh, really important sites. We have the Salt Lake Temple, which essentially represents uh, the headquarters of the church, right? It's the it's the flagship temple of the church. And um, back in the days of Christ um, and before, you know, from the time of King Solomon until the time of Christ, uh, that was the flagship temple of the church, right? Uh, back then, it was harder to build temples and you didn't have as many members of the church and you didn't have the technology of today. So you had the one temple. First it was Solomon's temple. And then later it was um, the, uh, <clears throat> the Herodian temple. And actually using BYU's virtual New Testament, I'll put the link for it in the description box below. Although right now it looks like this the site is taken down or I don't know if it's under maintenance, but it says that, quote unquote, the, the account is suspended and it doesn't have to do with like, you don't have to sign in. So I don't know what it's referring to. So you may not be able to download this right now, but you can check back later. But anyway, you know, here's uh, the temple at the time of Christ. We're viewing it from the Mount of Olives. If you look down, okay, this is the Mount of Olives. And uh, the Golden Gate is this gate right here, where if you went through, you would go straight to uh, the temple, just right down the middle and then toward the temple proper. Here's another view. Let's look from over here. Okay, there's the temple. And we were just looking at it from over here on the Mount of Olives. And the Golden Gate is right here. Okay, and, and don't worry, we're going to get into the history of it. So just hang on. Okay, so let's go back here. Oh, and by the way, uh, just in case you don't know. Okay, so again, here's the Golden Gate. There's the Mount of Olives, and then you got the BYU Jerusalem Center right there with its signature um, arcade and uh, blocky top up here, in which I do believe very well could be uh, the temple at the time that Christ comes. There's no BYU students there at the moment. Last that I checked, um, it could be turned into a temple space very easily. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same type of temple as what we have right now with ordinance rooms and a baptistry or anything like that. It could be just turned into a temple space, just like how the brethren are currently using the eighth floor of the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. But anyway, okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about the church symbol just a little bit more, and then we're going to talk about the Golden Gate, and then after that we'll talk about the front doors of the Salt Lake Temple, okay? So... Uh, in the April 2020 General Conference, that's when the new church symbol was introduced, and it was introduced by President Nelson himself, and he explained the symbolism. Uh, I pulled up this article, though, because it has like, has like a little visual. So talking about uh, this, arch, this arch shape, it says, Jesus stands under an arch as a reminder of his resurrection. He is a living Savior who reaches out to embrace all who will come unto him. Um, it, so basically, it's supposed to represent the tomb. In fact, I wonder if it says that anywhere else on this article. Yeah. Number three, the honor, honor the symbol's reverence. Uh, dep depicting Christ under an arch serves as a reminder of his emergence from the tomb three days after his death. Okay. And then, so that's like one element of the, the symbol. The next one is Christ himself. The center is a representation of Thorvaldsen's marble statue, the Christus. And then the last part is this uh, rectangular shape right here. The name of the church within a rectangular shape represents a, a cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. Okay, so those are the three elements of the symbol. Uh, like the entrance to the tomb uh, a resurrected Christ coming out of the tomb because he is now resurrected. And then the name of the church uh, in this rectangular shape and the shape itself representing Christ as the chief cornerstone of uh, the church. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let's look at, uh, let's focus on this shape right here, this archway, because in Jerusalem, uh, I don't know if you know, but there are, there are basically two, sites um, that that claim to be the site of his tomb in resurrection. And there's debate over this, but there's basically these two 
uh, widely recognized sites that could be the location where he was resurrected. Uh, the church, uh, the church has put out this article and it's relatively new. It's from May 3rd of last year. So it's not even a year old. Uh, it's called biblical sites in the Holy land testify of Christ. I have just a few things to read from here. When it comes to pinpointing sacred biblical sites in the Holy land and beyond, Sometimes the most certain thing about the, the historical location is the uncertainty. Uh, was the Savior crucified and then entombed at the two, at the two locations enveloped by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, with the tomb cut away over the centuries to be encased by a shrine called the Aedicule? I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the Aedicule. Or might the crucifixion and burial have taken, <coughs> sorry, taken place at or near Skull Hill? at the garden tomb, respectively, both outside the walls of the old city. So um, it goes on to just talk about how um, you have these two locations, and it doesn't seem that the church has an official position on where the tomb was. So here's the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, if we head over to the Wikipedia article for it, here's the, uh, whatever, the the Aedicule. If I'm pronouncing that right, it's uh, the shrine that's within the church. And based on what we just read from the church article, it says that the like the cave was chipped away over time. And so I guess the remnants of the cave are inside this shrine. Uh, if you've been here or if you know you know more about it, feel free to put that in the comments below. I've never been there. I, I hope to go there someday. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. Here's another view of the Aedicule right? This just looks epic. Just This looks like something from a movie. I'd like to go check this out. Um, here is what I presume to be the inside. It says the tomb of Jesus. So you go here and maybe this is where uh, they believe his body laid while it was in the tomb. Um, sure looks that way. But So anyway, you have this and I guess the original entrance to the tomb, it doesn't look like it's all too apparent from this. Um, I don't know if you go inside here, if you there's like a the actual entrance to the cave or something like that. But anyway, so that's the, the Aedicule in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right? And then we have the other location, uh, which is simply known as the Garden Tomb. And... Uh, I mean, obviously, because there's like this garden around it. It's a very pretty location. And uh, it seems like this is the location that's more favored by leaders of the church. Uh, I don't know if it's because they have a special understanding that this was the location, but I haven't heard them specifically say that. Uh, if you know of any like quote or if any um, prophet, apostle, general, general authority has said something about this site, then you know, let me know. Put it in the comments below so other people can see. But um, <clears throat> anyway, this is the one where you typically see uh, general authority authorities go when they visit Jerusalem. In fact, you have this YouTube video here. I, re I think I remember watching this in either seminary or institute. Well, no, it's probably it was probably seminary in high school um, of President Gordon B. Hinckley. And he's over here at the garden tomb. And uh, in the video, he doesn't say that this is where it happened. He he said something to the effect of, you know, this is a possible location. It, this may be where uh, Christ was. So, but anyway, uh, the point is, if this is the actual garden or the actual tomb, um, it does not have an arched shape. It's just a regular, you know, rectangular opening into the tomb. So it doesn't seem like you find that shape at either location, which isn't necessary. It's just, you know, it's supposed to be symbolic and it's just a, it's a pleasant shape to look at in the first place. But I do have to wonder if there is significance to the dimensions of the church symbol. Okay, let's go back to, let's go back to, um, no, not there, not OBS. Let's go back to Photoshop. All right, so... Here, you, let, let's break it down, okay? So here you have the church symbol. <clears throat> and essentially what it is, um, when we're talking about the, uh, the outline of the shape, um, first, it's a circle, okay? That's what 
uh, produces the, the round shape up top. Uh, you draw a circle right here, and then you add a square, okay? Right where the, the curving stops and it starts to go straight, that's where you can easily just draw a square. It goes down to this line right here underneath his feet, okay? So it's basically a, a combination of a circle and a square, um, perfectly cutting the circle in half, right? And then uh, furthermore, you can add another square down here and you see how Photoshop, it tells you like the midpoint of uh, the shape uh, represent. So you have the corners right here, but then you have the midpoints. Uh, the midpoint perfectly lines up with uh, this bottom line, uh, the bottom, the bottom line, <coughs> sorry, the bottom line of the cornerstone uh, part of the, the symbol. So essentially what you have when we're just looking at the, the squares is if we were to draw lines, um, it's basically half of the square, like half of the height of the square is the height of the cornerstone piece of the, the church symbol. So you, hopefully you can see this and you understand what I'm talking about. So you have this half of the square, you have this half of the square. If you were to duplicate one of the halves and bring it down, then you would get the height. Well, you would get the height and the width um, of the cornerstone, right? So this is how it's broken down. And so you might think, well, okay, so this is a pretty common uh, thing. Like, of course, you're going to have arches at some point that are after this pattern where you have a circle and a square, or maybe like, like uh, with this shape, you, you add half of the square of the square to the bottom, and then you end up with this. And uh, that's true. I'm sure that there are a lot of arches in the ancient world and in modern times that simply use this pattern. It's a very basic pattern, a circle and a square. But, um, and you can easily look this up. Just do a Google search. You'll find lots of examples. That's not always the case. Here's just a few right here. Sometimes you have arches that are kind of pointy at the top. Um, here's an example of one right here at the top left and then one here at the bottom right. The one in the bottom right is wider. The one at the top left is more narrow. Uh, you have this one right here, which um, it's definitely not a full square at the bottom. The top looks like it probably is a, a perfect like half circle, but they don't include the full square at the bottom. And then over here, this is in Rome, the bottom, the bottom left. You can tell that uh, it's definitely not a square. <laughs> It, it's uh, much longer than a square, but the tops do appear to be uh, perfectly circular. So you do have different designs and styles, but you're also going to find plenty of times when you do have the, the square and the circle together um, as shown here. And so that appears to be the case. Where is it? Which one? That appears to be the case with this, right? with the golden gate and then for the solid temple um, you just add another half a square to the bottom and then you get the shape of the front doors of the salt lake temple now let's get into the history of uh, the golden gate as well as the front doors of the salt lake temple and uh, the potential implications because even though these are somewhat common shapes uh, i think I, I do believe um and, and i have reason to believe but I do believe that this was intentional in that there's more symbolism. And, and the obvious symbolism is that uh, Christ is coming, you know, the second coming. He's going to be coming through these doors. The front doors of the Salt Lake Temple are, uh, they're sealed. They're locked. You don't go through there. You go through a separate entrance. And then, as you can see with the Golden Gate, let me take these uh, symbols off. Well, it's uh, sealed with with stones. Uh, there's not getting any getting. There's not any getting through that with a key. Uh, there's going to have to be some construction done, and uh, demolition and stuff like that to open this up. <laughs> so, um, so that's an interesting. That's an interesting parallel between the two locations. It's also interesting, and we've talked about this, you know, plenty of times before. But another similarity that the two locations have is that, um, oh, no, wait, sorry, not the two locations. But what's interesting is that the Temple Mount, he currently has 
another religion that has uh, a religious structure on top of the Temple Mount, which blocks the way for the third temple to be built. Uh, just like how us, not in Salt Lake City, but us in Independence, Missouri, we have this other church, another religion that owns that spot, the the spot for the first temple of the 24 temple complex. We have built, let me just pull it up on Google Earth. I never know, you know, who's watching or if they're brand new or not. So let's just go to, let's go to Independence, Missouri just so you can see it. Turn off 2023. There we go. So just like how we have that problem over there in uh, Jerusalem, you know, uh, how you have the Dome of the Rock right where uh, the temple was, uh, we have a similar problem here in Independence, Missouri, where you can see uh, where the temple would go uh, because they have they have it all marked and... Um, there's kind of like this little, not really pathway, but uh, they do things out there where, where like they'll take their church and go out and kind of like uh, go around the uh, perimeter of where the, the temple would be. And I think it, it causes these, well, no, I guess people are probably like walk from cornerstone to cornerstone, but I've seen them also do things where like they stand out there and uh, stand around the perimeter of where the temple would be. But whatever the case, it's left this uh, rectangular shape and you can see the dimensions of the temple. But that's just the first temple. There's supposed to be 24. And uh, we've talked about the Independence Visitor Center, how Alvin R. Dyer of the First Presidency, he had like this special uh, mission to oversee the lands of the church in Missouri. And uh, during that time, he consulted with David O. McKay, and they built the Independence Visitor Center to be uh, one of the 24 temples, and it's the same dimensions as uh, what this temple was. They, they're they're all the same, and they all look like they're supposed to look like the Kirtland Temple, um, unless they unless they change the plan. Maybe they would keep these arches, and I, I have no idea. But they could renovate this to make it look the way it's supposed to look. So, it's some interesting things that we have in common um, with Judaism, and uh, in this case, the the Temple Mount in Independence, Missouri as well as the Temple Mount and uh, the Salt Lake Temple, okay? So let's go back here, and let's first talk about, uh, let's talk about the Golden Gate. Okay, first, we're going to look at this article in the, the April 1991 ensign called Jesus and the Temple. Okay, this, you'll have to understand this, okay? Holda Gates. The main entrance and exit to the temple. So don't think that the Golden Gate was <clears throat> the main entrance to the temple. Like if you were in Jerusalem and you're going up to the temple, you see how there's like nothing really over here? It's all just like barren. Um, it's obviously much different today, but back then you didn't have all these like apartment buildings and churches and stuff over here. Uh, so Jerusalem proper, let's look at this view, uh, it was like behind the temple and kind of surrounding the temple. And the main entrance for, um, you know, the public would be these two ramps right here. Okay, let's go to this view. Okay, so here we are on the south side of the temple, and you can see the people going to, you know, the mikvah to, to wash before ascending to the temple. And uh, you would go up or down these ramps, depending if you if you were entering the Temple Mount or if you were exiting, right? And then from there, uh, you would go past this uh, gated area right here called the Soreg, and then go to whichever gate um, you were going to for that day. They have different purposes. And I did a video a while ago where we went through every single gate and what they were all for and all the different chambers and... Uh, it was a really good video, a really good video. Um, so anyway, yeah, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't come like have, as an average person through the Golden Gate, uh, which points right at the Mount of Olives. Okay, let's go back to the article. So the Holda Gates, those are the ones that, are, that have the ramps. The main entrance and exit to the Temple Mount were two gates called the Holda Gates, leading through the walls of the Temple Mount from the south, uh, through the one on the right, a person would enter, 
to perform the holy work in the temple after having gone through ritual washings or cleansings in small pools or fonts uh, just outside the walls. And by the way, they're called mikvahs. The left gate was the exit from the Temple Mount. Okay, now the Golden Gate, otherwise known as the Susa Gate or the Shushan Gate or the Mercy Gate, has all those names. Susa Gate. The eastern gate of the Temple Mount was called the Susa Gate. It faced toward Susa or Shushan, the Persian capital, where parts of the biblical stories of Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah, and others unfolded. This gate was said to have been lower than the other gates so that the priest the priests who were sacrificing a red heifer a symbolic representation of the redeemer across the valley on the mount of olives might look directly into the temple and uh, we recently talked about this because uh, we i did a video about the red heifers and if you missed that video you should watch it because we are coming up to that time where this may actually be happening where the red heifers are, where uh, one or more red heifers are going to be uh, sacrificed for their ashes. So here's a depiction on the Temple Institute website of the Herodian Temple. And um, there would have been this, uh, I think they call, what's it called, the causeway. You would have had this, essentially, this bridge going from the temple to this location over here on the Temple Mount. And uh, in the case of the red heifer, this is where. Um, it would be sacrificed and it's supposed to be in line of sight of the temple. And uh, so, so that the priest could look into the temple and toward the Holy of Holies. Okay. Um, like I said, the Christian group, I'd have to find the article, but we've talked about it before. The Christian group, Bone Israel has actually purchased the land and uh, secured it so that whenever the red heifers are ready, uh, the Jews can go ahead and do the the sacrifice and get the ashes. And we may be seeing that within just the next few months. And that'll be the first time in, like, I don't know how long, but at least over, at least a, a couple thousand years. It's about to happen in just the next few months. But anyway, in this video, we're talking about the Golden Gate. And this is one of the uh, significant things about the Golden Gate. The red heifer, right? Let's go back to the church article. So let me just read it again. The priests who were sacrificing a red heifer, no, wait, sorry. The gate was said to have been lower than the other gates so that the priests who were sacrificing a red heifer, a symbolic representation of the Redeemer, across the Valley of the Mount of Olives might look directly into the temple. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to, this is Bain Harim. Uh, tourism services. They have this little thing here talking about the Golden Gate. Uh, Jerusalem's Golden Gate in Jewish tradition. The Gate of Mercy would have given visitors the most uh, direct access to the Jewish temple. During the Crusader period, when Jews were denied access to Temple Mount, they would come to this gate to pray and ask for mercy. Hence, the name in Jewish tradition, Gate of Mercy. According to Jewish, Jewish tradition, the Messiah will enter the city through the Eastern Gate. Another Jewish tradition holds that on Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, a messenger was sent through the gate from the temple to the desert with a sacrificial lamb. Okay, so the Jews are expecting Messiah. Let's go over here. They're expecting to Messiah when he shows up to enter in through this gate. Okay, um, the Golden Gate in Christian tradition. According to some Christian literature, the Golden Gate was where Mary's parents, Anne and Joachim, uh, met with, or sorry, met, met following the Annunciation where Mary learned of her future son. From this, the gate became a symbol of Mary's miraculous conception. Some Christian writings say that this was the gate where Jesus entered the city on Palm Sunday. Which is interesting to think about, um, especially since, you know, there was this like a really big, really big deal made in the April 2023 General Conference about Palm Sunday. Um, maybe it's because, maybe it's because the Jews are right and some of the Christian tradition is right that uh, Christ is going to come through here. That very well may happen. 
Um, I guess we'll have to wait to wait and see. I don't know of any uh, church doctrine like unique to our church that confirms that that Christ would come to the temple going through the Golden Gate, um, but he might. Now, remember, I just said that I think that the BYU Jerusalem Center, which would be over here somewhere, I really believe that that could serve as the temple to greet Christ when he comes. But even if it does, I wouldn't be surprised if later on a temple is built here or the Dome of the Rock is converted into a temple. Um, I did a video about, about that one time, the idea of turning the Dome of the Rock into a temple, and I don't see any problem with that. It can be renovated, um, it can be added onto, or simply renovated inside, it can re be repurposed, who knows. But however it happens, it may be that at some point, whether it's like right away, as soon as Christ comes to the Mount of Olives, or shortly thereafter, maybe a few months, a few weeks afterwards, uh, maybe he will come through this gate. Just maybe not on the day that he initially comes. Or he might. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? The Mount of Olives is going to uh, cleave in twain. You know, who knows what effect that's going to have on the Temple Mount? Uh, maybe it'll affect the Temple Mount. Maybe the Shushin Gate will... Um, maybe the, the, the sealed portion of it will break uh, because of the earthquake, and then he'll be able to go through there because of the earthquake. Who knows? Anything's possible. Okay. Um, the gate of eternal life in the Islamic tradition. In Muslim tradition, each of the gate's two openings has a name. The southern opening is known as Bab al-Rama, gate of mercy, and the northern one is Bab al-Tuba, gate of repentance. In Arabic, the complete gate is called Bab al-Zahabi or Bab al-Dahabi, golden gate, as well as gate of eternal life. Muslim, Muslims consider Jesus a prophet and Messiah, not Messiah in our sense, obviously, uh, probably something more along the lines of uh, the Jews and how they, how they think of Messiah. Muslims consider Jesus a prophet and Messiah and support the Christian belief that Jesus entered the city through this gate. Talking about like Palm Sunday. Uh, of course, that's not how they would think of it, but uh, the gate is believed by some to be the site of the final judgment and the site of the future resurrection. This has led many Muslims being buried in the Muslim cemetery immediately outside the gate. The gate leads to the, to the Al-Aqsa compound on Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque stands. So, and I'm sure that you already know this, but in case you, you didn't realize, uh, you see all these, um, you know, these... Uh, uh, what you, graves oh my gosh what's wrong with me you see all these graves and tombstones and stuff like that uh, that's the reason why according to this uh, you know again there's debate about this and we're about to read some, about some of that debate so you have Muslim graves over here uh, you have Jewish graves uh, over here and you can oh my gosh you can see there's just a ton of them there are a ton, my gosh. If you didn't know any better, if you didn't have like the, if you didn't have those buses in that road there, you'd think it's like a, a pyramid or something like that or some like ancient uh, structure. But no, it's all graves. Okay, let's go back to what we were reading. Okay, why is the Golden Gate, let's say, why, sorry, why is the Golden Gate Jerusalem so special. The Golden Gate is thought to be the oldest of the city of the city's eight gates. It may have been constructed in uh, 520 AD, although the exact date date is unknown. So, in other words, this wouldn't be the original entrance. It wouldn't be the original gate. It was built well after uh, the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Although the exact date is unknown, several times the gate was sealed and reopened by different rulers throughout the years. It was closed in the year 810 by Muslim rulers and reopened in 1102 by the Crusaders. In 1541, the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman 
uh, ordered the gate sealed for the final time. Suleiman may have sealed the gate uh, to better defend the city or because he wanted to prevent the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecy of the Messiah's return through the Golden Gate. The Golden Gate holds an important place in Christian, Jewish, and Islamic traditions, and in all three religions, the gate is associated with the coming of the Messiah. So that is really interesting. Again, remember, we're talking about this. We're talking about the church symbol and how it fits within this gate. And in the church symbol, just like what we're doing right now, uh, you have Christ within the doorway, right? It's very fitting. It's very fitting. Okay. We got some more to look at, though. All right. Uh, We're going to get a little bit more detailed. Uh, This is the Wikipedia article for the Golden Gate. Um, I'll probably... Sometimes I feel like I have these things all well prepared, but then sometimes it just gets really redundant. The gate has been sealed since 1541, the most recent of several sealings. Its interior can be accessed from the Temple Mount. And there's a picture of that. We'll look at that in just a minute. In Jewish tradition, the Messiah will enter Jerusalem through this gate, coming from the Mount of Olives. Christians and Muslims generally believe that this was the gate through which Jesus entered Jerusalem. The Golden Gate is located in the northern third of the Temple Mount's eastern wall. The eastern wall, you know what, let's look at that on Google Earth. Let's head over to Jerusalem. Double click. Okay. So here's the Temple Mount. And the Golden Gate is right here. So you see that it's not like it's not like it's lined up with the Dome of the Rock. Okay. It goes like straight through like this. I've watched a number of things that have said that um, there's different ideas about exactly where on the Temple Mount the temple stood. The obvious location would be where the Dome of the Rock is, because that's where you have the foundation rock. And uh, the Jews believe uh, that that is essentially what was inside the Holy of Holies. Um, And it's the site where uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and also where uh, Jacob, you know, had a a stone be his pillow as he had the, the dream or the vision of Jacob's ladder, that it took place right there. But anyway, we're talking about this, uh, location right here. Okay. In relation to the rest of the temple mount. Okay. The Eastern wall now visible was built in the last, in at least four stages during the reign of Hezekiah during the time of Zerubbabel in the Hasmonean period and famously in the Herodian period. The present golden gate is thought to have been, been built on top of ruins of an earlier gate. In the, west, in the Eastern Wall. And uh, we're going to look at another article, but I just want to show you this right now. They have a depiction of that. So this is essentially, um, the, if you were to dig down, this is essentially what you'd have. So you have the Golden Gate up here, and then underneath the ground, you'd have the original Golden Gate directly below it. Okay. All right, back to this. Um, The first century historian Josephus mentions an eastern gate in his uh, Antiquities of the Jews and makes note of the fact that this gate was considered within a far northeastern extremity of the inner sacred court. The Mishnah, which is a Jewish text, it's essentially the oral Torah is what they call it. The Mishnah mentions a former causeway which led out to the Temple Mount eastward over the Kidron Valley, extending as far as the Mount of Olives. And that's what we were looking at earlier, right? This causeway right here. Rabbi Eliezer, or Eliezer, dissenting, says that it was not a causeway, but rather marble pillars over over which cedar boards had been laid, used by the high priest and his entourage. This gate, known as the Shushan Gate, 
was not used by the masses to enter the Temple Mount. So we've already covered that. This was not for the general public, but reserved only for the high priest and all those that aided him when taking out the red heifer or the scapegoat on Yom Kippur. So this is really interesting because this is a lot of uh, a lot of Christ symbolism, right? In those ancient times, you you only had the one high priest, and it, it was the high priest that uh, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur, and also on Yom Kippur, uh, he would go through the gate. Um, so <laughs> it's like if you if you just um, switched out high priest for Christ, because we know that Christ is the great high priest, and the high priest back in those days was a representation of Christ, how Christ is the only one that can go into the Holy of Holies of his own accord, uh, through his own merits. That's what that's what the symbolism was of the high priest being able to go in there on Yom Kippur. But you have this symbol of Christ going through this gate for a couple different occasions, Yom Kippur and also the burning of the red heifer. It's it's so interesting and fascinating, you know? Again, we're talking about this because the church symbol fits in this gate. And the church symbol has a picture of Christ, a resurrected Christ, the great high priest. Okay, so let's continue. The present gate. The construction date of the present day Golden Gate is unknown, as Muslim authorities forbid archaeological work at the Temple Mount. The vast majority of the 19th and early 20th century scholars, such as Robinson, Condor, Bartlett, Vincent, and Abel, Melchior de Vogue and Cresswell dated the gate to different periods prior to the Islamic period. Later, in light of developing research, new arguments have been advanced by, by many scholars such as Hamilton, Sharon, Bendove, Rosen Ayalon, uh, Safir, and Wilkinson that the gate should be dated to the 7th to 8th century AD. Uh, the Umayyad Uma, I don't know how to pronounce that. Umayyad period. Today opinions, <coughs> sorry. Today opinions are shared between a late Byzantine and early uh, Umayyad date. So again, the what what we have right now is not the original. It was uh, built well after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. This is not the original. The original is like is it's underground. It's underneath it. Okay, let's continue. Uh, The ceiling of the gate. Closed by the Muslims in 810, reopened in 1102 by the Crusaders, it was walled up by Saladin after regaining Jerusalem in 1187. Ottoman Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent rebuilt it together with the city walls, but walled it up in 1541, and it stayed that way. Now, this next uh, paragraph, it has a lot of uh, citation needed, so just be aware of that. But it, it seems like, I've, I feel like I've seen this many other times, other places, so I don't, even though there should be a citation here for the Wikipedia article, I feel like this information actually is correct. But anyway, Suleiman may have taken this decision purely for defensive reasons, but in Jewish tradition, this is the gate through which the Anointed One, Messiah, will enter Jerusalem. In relation to the Muslim belief Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, it is suggested that Suleiman the Magnificent sealed off the Golden Gate to prevent a false Messiah, or Antichrist, coming through the entrance. And I don't know that they would call it Antichrist, uh, because Christ is like a tight. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but you get the idea. So you don't get like some you know, imposter going through there and being like, I am the Messiah. Look, I'm coming through the gate. The Ottomans also built a cemetery in front of the gate to prevent a false precursor to the anointed one, Elijah, from passing through the gate. Citation needed. This belief was based upon two premises. First, according to Islamic teaching, Elijah is a descendant of Aaron, making him a priest or Kohen. Second, 
that a Jewish Kohen is not permitted to enter a cemetery. And we know this, that a Jewish priest, the Kohenim, they're not supposed to come in contact with a dead body. This second premise is not wholly correct because a Kohen is permitted to enter a cemetery in which either Jews or non-Jews are buried, such as the one outside the Golden Gate, as long as certain laws or halakha regarding purity are followed. Well, yeah, <coughs> in my best understanding at the moment is that, uh, yes, a Kohen could come in contact with a dead body so long as he... Uh, purifies himself with the ashes of the red heifer. So that's why the red heifer is such a big deal. Uh, if you didn't see that episode, wh what they've done is they've done this like really stringent search and uh, put together this registry of Kohanim who have not, who were not born in a hospital because if they had been, they could have potentially come in contact with the dead body, not like physically touching a dead body, but being in too close of a proximity, I guess. So they, they've like searched out Kohanim that could not have possibly become impure so that they uh, can do the red heifer um, ritual. And then after that, all the rest of the Kohanim, as well as the rest of the Jewish nation, can be purified with the, with the ashes of the red heifer. But you have to have that initial group first that is that you know is perfectly clean. All right, let's continue. Uh, here's a picture of uh, the inside, like on the other, if you were on the on the other side of the wall, you know, there, here's like a, a doorway here. And I think I've seen some video of in here. Essentially, it's used, I believe, as a mosque. Don't quote me on that. But it is, it is a place where you, uh, as a Muslim, you can gather there and do... Um, you know, Muslim things. Here's another picture. You see the doors down there. So essentially it's uh it's like a building right now. It's not so much a sealed off gate. It is that, but it's also a building. And uh, we're going to read some more about that because there's something really interesting about it being a building. Okay. So we're going to go to this article called um, the riddle of the Shushan gate. Uh, by Rabbi Leibel Resnick, and this is on uh, Jewish Action, the magazine of the Orthodox Union. Okay, he uh, went there. And he found something interesting and took pictures. Okay, the seventy long years of the Babylonian exile had ended. Darius, the benevolent uh, Persian king, son of Queen Esther and King uh, Akashivarosh granted his Jewish subjects permission to return to Zion and rebuild their temple. The Mishnah, which is the oral Torah, tells us that the returning Jews made an engraving of Shushan, the capital of the Persian Empire, above the newly built eastern gateway of the, of the Temple Mount. The engraving commemorated the miracle of Purim, or Purim, and reminded the, Jew, the Jewish people from whence they came and to retain loyal to their Persian benefactors. Because Persia was east of the Holy Land, the Eastern Temple Gateway was chosen as the site for this memorial engraving. The Talmud also tells us, and the Talmud is like, um, it's a compilation of commentaries about the Mishnah, the Oral Torah. The Talmud also tells us that near the Eastern Gateway was a room in which the national standard of length, the cubit, was engraved upon the wall. That's kind of cool. A medieval Jewish tradition foretells that the prophet Elijah will lead the Mashiach into the temple grounds through the Shushan Gate. Elijah is a Kohen. Again, that's a priest. Elijah is a Kohen, and a Kohen may not enter a cemetery. Many centuries ago, some scheming Muslims, this is his words, not mine, uh, placed an Arab cemetery along the eastern wall to foil Elijah's plan. However, in the Talmud, there is a discussion of whether or not a Kohen uh, may enter a non-Jewish cemetery. The sages sought the opinion of the prophet Elijah himself, and he ruled that a member of the, of the priestly clan could indeed enter a non-Jewish cemetery. Obviously, uh, the Muslim designer of the cemetery was not a Talmudic scholar. All right, here's a, 
a picture that he took. Uh, the, the Muslim cemetery is built up along the eastern wall and completely obscures the remains of the Shushan Gateway from view. Several hundred years ago, a plague in Jerusalem caused the death of many Arabs. The victims of the plague were buried in a mass grave in front of the Shushan Gateway, and a monument to the tragedy was placed nearby. Over the course of time, the bodies decomposed and compressed, creating a cavern in the cemetery. All right. And there's a picture that he took. Um, and it says here, view inside the cavern. The stones arching upward are built onto the original Shushan gateway. So I guess like you can kind of see it here. I guess this is like the upper part of the original gateway. Uh, the existence of this cavern was not publicized because uh, the Muslims do not want curiosity seekers trampling through their cemetery. They do not permit non-Muslims to enter those hallowed grounds. Not intending to be disrespectful, I knew that in order to, com to complete my exploration of the walls of Jerusalem, I would need to inspect the cavern on my next trip to Jerusalem. When I came to the Eastern Wall Cemetery, I found that an Arab caretaker was stationed there to make certain no illicit entry would be made. I waited and watched from afar. Around noon, the caretaker decided to take a lunch break. As he walked off to a luncheonette in the Arab village below, I sneaked into the cemetery to spot where the top of the cavern was located. It was located over, it was covered over with a rusty metal sheet. After pulling aside the metal covering, I leaned inside the cave. It was pitch black. I began taking pictures at random, unsure of what I was photographing. My work was completed just in time. The caretaker was returning with a metal pipe in hand. I don't know if that was for him or if he was doing some work, but um, I made a hasty retreat. <laughs> as soon as I came back uh, to the States, I had the pictures developed. I could see that the floor of the cavern was littered with the remains of corpses, skulls, and skeletal remains. More importantly, in the rear of the cavern was an exposed lower portion of the eastern wall. On that exposed portion of the eastern wall was the upper segment of an arch, the remains of the Shushan Gateway. From which small from okay from that small segment of an arch, I could determine that the original Shushan Gateway was a double gateway, similar to the double uh, Kulda exit on the on the southern wall. Oh, that's that's what we were reading before in this church article, uh, the Holda gates. It's because in, in Hebrew they have this sound, um, you know. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of it, but the the guttural like sound. So you can either write it as Holda or uh, with a ch, and just supposed to know that it's supposed to be Holda, right? Um, I don't I don't do the best job at making that sound, but let's go back to where we were reading. So he's talking about those. Um, so he says the original Shushan gateway was a double gateway similar to the double Holda gate at the Southern wall. And remember the Southern wall, that, that was the, uh, the main entrance to the temple Mount through these ramps. So I guess he's saying that it's the same style as what they've seen with, uh, the Southern wall and the Southern entrance. Um, I don't think that's how, Oh no, it is de uh, depicted that way here. They have it as an archway, like a double archway. And then over there, it's like a triple archway. Okay. Anyway, um, with that meager bit of information, I could reconstruct the ancient Shushan Gateway. Uh, the formation of the cavern also yielded the opportunity to search for the room near the Shushan Gate alluded to in the Talmud, which contained the National Cubit Standard. Such a discovery would resolve once and for all the great halakhic, which is the Jewish law, debate as to the exact length of a cubit. I be, That's kind of neat. Yeah, if they found that and they knew exactly how long a cubit's supposed to be because they found the original standard uh, in that gateway, that, that would be so cool. I began to plan my next illegal expedition to the site. When I arrived there the following year, my great expectations were quickly dashed. The Arabs had filled in the cavern with all sorts of trash and debris. I was not prepared to dig up and cart away several tons 
of refuse. <laughs> you weren't? Um, when King Solomon built the first temple, okay, now look at this. We're going to be talking about something different here now. When King Solomon built the first temple, he constructed a special two-chambered building in the temple compound. One chamber was for bridegrooms, right? Whenever we think about the second coming, uh, one of the metaphors or symbols that we use for Christ is him being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. So it's interesting thinking about this. Let me just continue reading. One chamber was for was for bridegrooms, and the other was for people observing the traditional period of mourning. Those who participated in the temple service went to these rooms to offer the appropriate words, either of congratulations or of condolence. These rooms were built above the eastern gateway and were reconstructed in the in the second temple. So not only do we have this uh this thing with, uh, you know, the Golden Gate and the High Priest. But now we also have uh, bridegroom imagery. So essentially, if I'm understanding him correctly, um, up here somewhere, there'd be two rooms above the gate, one for mourners and then one for bridegrooms. So we have the High Priest symbolism, Christ being the High, the high Priest and going through the the front entrance of the Temple Mount, and then above that same entrance, a room for bridegrooms. It's just, it's so perfect. It's so perfect. Um, and I think that's all. I mean, he goes on and talks about more things. There's more pictures and stuff. Um, I'll put this in the, I'll put this in the description box below. Um, now let's move on to the Salt Lake Temple. Okay, let's go back here to Photoshop. Let's look at the Salt Lake Temple. We'll zoom out. So Salt Lake Temple, the front two doors are sealed, and the two doors are in the shape of the church symbol, the, the full church symbol, including the cornerstone. Again, let me turn it off so you can see and turn it back on. It's the same shape. Okay, <clears throat> so I have heard a number of times that the reason why they're sealed is because, or why they're locked, is because um, it's it's supposed to be for Christ when he comes at the second coming. And I can't quite nail that down. The best that I can do is uh, point you to this uh, paper that was written. This is uh, Exterior Symbolism of the Salt Lake Temple, Reflecting the Faith That Called the Place into Being by Richard G. Oman and John P. Snyder. And uh, this is on BYU Studies. Okay. So we're just going to read a few things from this. Um, if I can find it again, the highlights, where are you? Okay. Holiness to the Lord. Oh, lost it. Sorry. Holiness to the Lord. Above the second window in the east central tower is a large dedicatory plaque which reads, Holiness to the Lord. Now, if you don't know what that's talking about, if you haven't been to the Salt Lake Temple or you're not too familiar with it, this is a picture I took, by the way. I'm also a photographer. I do uh, graphic design and photography. I actually started out with photography, but when we lived in the Salt Lake area, I took this picture. I'm very proud of it. I love it. It was like just perfect time of year, get the cherry blossoms, and then you have uh, the plaque that we're talking about, right? Holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord, built by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commenced April 6th, 1853, completed April 6th, 1893. Okay, so we're talking about that. <coughs> um, and then it says that uh, President Hinckley made this comment about the dedicatory plaque, quote, the first phrase of this statement is a declared recognition of the Almighty and a pledge of holiness and reverence before him. The second is a statement of ownership. This is the house or this is his house built through the consecrations of the people and presented to him as their offering of love and sacrifice. 
end quote. The first phrase, holiness to the Lord, is a millennial declaration about building a Zion to which the Lord can return at his second coming. Quote, um, and I should, what is this a quote of? Let's go down to 99. This is from History of the Church, Volume 2, pages 357 to 358. Okay. Quote, In speaking of the gathering, we mean to be understood as speaking of it according to Scripture, the gathering of the elect of the Lord out of every nation on earth, and bringing them to the place of the Lord of hosts, when the city of righteousness shall be built, and where the people shall be of one heart and one mind, where the Savior, where, when the Savior comes, yea, where the people shall walk with God like Enoch and be free from sin. The word of the Lord is precious, and when we read that the veil spread over all the nations will be destroyed, and the pure in heart see God and reign with him a thousand years on earth, we want all honest men to have a chance to gather and build up a city of righteousness where even upon the bells of the horses shall be written holiness to the Lord. End quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie also comments on the relationship between house of the Lord and the city of Enoch. Quote, Enoch, Enoch continued his preaching and righteousness unto the people of God, and it came to pass in his days that he built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion. Uh, what was, more na- what was more natural than to name the city after the people? The pure in heart called their abode by the, the name of, sorry, called their abode by the name City of Holiness. Their every, th- their every thought was holiness to the Lord, and blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Um, and I'm not meaning to be disrespectful or anything. I, I might have to push back on this a little bit. I'm not so sure that holiness to the Lord uh, specifically is a millennial uh, declaration. Um, I I feel like it could fit in, but it's not strictly a millennial declaration. Um, The reason why, but there's more, there's more reason to believe that the, the East doors do have to do with the second coming. We'll read about that later, but um, I want to just add this one caveat, caveat, yeah, caveat <laughs> that um, the first time that we see the phrase holiness to the Lord in the scriptures is in the book of Exodus chapter 28, verse 36. And this is talking about um, the high priest and, and his clothing and, and the crown that he wore. Verse 36, and thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Okay, and uh, you can see an example of this uh, if we go to the Temple Institute website where, let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, it doesn't really do much. Anyway, you can see this uh, this like gold crown right here. So you have the turban up here, this white part, but then there's a crown. And on the front of it is where you have holiness to the Lord. It says it right here. Let me see if I can zoom in this way. Oh, that kind of works. And you shall make a, a show plate of pure gold, and you shall engrave upon it like the engraving of a seal, holy to Hashem, which is the name. And they say that instead of saying Jehovah, but in um, our English, you know, King James Version and probably other Bibles too, that instead of saying the name or Jehovah, they put in the Lord. But holiness to the Lord. Okay, it goes right here on uh, the forehead of the high priest. Okay. This is our first reference. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with the millennium. Um, it was something that was, as far as I know, the first time started, uh, with the high priest during the days of Moses. Um, and then if we go to the Institute student manual, uh, for this, it says the golden diadem and the mitre or mitre, I don't know the mitre or hat, was made of fine linen, and each priest wore one. In addition, the high priest wore wore a golden band on the front of his mitre on the forehead. Engraved on the band were the words holiness to the Lord, signifying that the high priest would be characterized by this attribute, and second, that Christ, the great high priest, 
would be perfectly holy before God. So this goes back to that idea that in those days, the high priest was essentially um, like standing in for or a foreshadowing of Christ, you know, him being the great high priest. So that's really what it has to do with. And um, interestingly, they brought this up in Come Follow Me. This was for 2022. Uh, This is for the week of May 2nd to May 8th of 2022. And the name of the lesson is Holiness to the Lord. And um, it talks about that. It says, Leaving Egypt, as important and miraculous as that was, didn't fully accomplish God's purposes for the children of Israel. Even even future posterity in the promised land wasn't God's ultimate objective for them. These were only steps toward what God really wanted for his people. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. From Leviticus 19.2 How did God seek to make his people holy when they had known nothing but captivity for generations? He commanded them to create a place of holiness to the Lord, a tabernacle in the wilderness. So there you have that idea of holiness to the Lord. <clears throat> and in this case, the tabernacle and then becoming a holy people. So I would just add that to what we're reading here. So it's it's not, when we look at this, it's not strictly millennial per se, although <clears throat> there is going to be a lot more holiness to the Lord. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the horses and on their bells will have holiness to the Lord, which is essentially symbolic of how even like common things, um, the, the the state of spirituality that we're going to be living in during the millennium is going to be much higher than it is now. That it's going to be, whereas like sin is very commonplace now, uh, in the millennium, it's going to be just holiness all over. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be many cities of holiness. Uh, we've talked about the fact that a stake is essentially a city and it's a city of holiness. That's what Bruce Armaconkey said. Um, so anyway, let's get back to this, though. Let's uh, skip on down to this part. Okay, the house of the Lord. Because the temple is the earthly sanctuary of the Lord, it is physically set off from the world. Quote, The traffic outside the wall of the temple is now frequently heavy and noisy. Within the wall... There is an environment of peace and beauty, end quote. Footnote 102. I'm not going to look at that right now. Aside from the peace attained within the walls of the temp- of Temple Square, the positioning of the temple within those walls adds some symbolic elements. The main access to the Temple Square, uh, to Temple Square is from the north and south gates, which are located in the center and the south, the center of the, the south and north walls of the square. A secondary gate is located in the center of the west wall of the square. There is no public access from the east until very recently, when an eastern gate was made. None of these four gates center on the temple. Now, it's interesting because that that is how it was, but now with um, the renovation that's going on with Temple Square, that's actually changed. And I don't know, because like... Uh, these two that wrote this paper, they're they're making it seem like the original planning for the Temple Square it was done symbolically because, well, let's read this and then we'll look at w- what the change is with Temple Square. The front of the temple faces directly into the east wall, uh, less than 75 feet away. In in fairly recent times, the thick masonry, the thick masonry wall directly in front of the temple has been replaced with a high ornamental iron fence making the temple more visible from the street. However, there is still no access to the front of the temple from the street. Now, that is still true. Okay, at this point, let's look at the the picture. Okay, so here is the renovated uh, temple square. And what they were just saying was that before this renovation... Uh, you could either come through Temple Square this way on the west side. So like you see this uh, crosswalk right here, you'd cross over here or you'd come from like the sidewalk either way, north or south. And then you could go through this gate. You can't see it too well. Let me zoom in a little bit more. So see this right here? There was There's this entrance that is 
or was and still is on the west side. And then you had this entrance right here, but you see how it's not centered on the temple? Like there's this like walkway that goes right down Temple Square. Uh, this walkway connects this gate on the south side to this gate on the north side. And then if you keep walking, uh, it takes you to the conference center, but it's not centered on the temple. Um, <clears throat> and then on the north side, you can't really see it here. I think I have another image. You can't see it too well, but uh, essentially they had put in like that, that like iron, the ornamental iron fence that they were talking about in the front where, where, and gosh, I'm having a hard time picturing it. I can't remember if it was centered or not, but, and I don't know if, if anything's changed with that, but you can see here, there's not a wall uh, like there used to be a long time ago. And so now th it does appear like this is centered on the temple and you can walk through this front part, but you still cannot go through the front doors. So to get into the temple, you don't go through the front doors uh, just like how with the Temple Mount, you don't you don't go through the Golden Gate to get to the Temple Mount. Uh, you actually go through the side, just just like the 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 ancient temples, Solomon's Temple and the Herodian Temple. What you do is, um, I'm not sure if both of these buildings are going to go into the temple. Um, it used to be that you had this one, I don't know what you'd call it, like uh, like a temple annex, I think. You'd go through here, so you'd go like onto the Main Street Plaza and then make your way to the entrance, which was right here, and then that would take you underground, and then you would take a tunnel that goes uh, into the temple and go that way. And that's essentially still how it's going to, that's still how, how it's going to be. I, what, I, what I just don't know is if you can use both of these, temp, these um, buildings or just this one um, in the same spot of, as the old one. I, I don't know. I haven't seen anything to really clarify that. So <clears throat> anyway, yeah, this is how you, you go into the temple, the Sali temple. You don't go in through the front doors. You go in through the side and go under the ground and then up into the temple. Okay. But now let me just point something out. Uh, they have made changes to where uh, you have some new gates. You see this right here? So you have the old gates right here that go from the conference center and then down the middle of temple square along this path, that's still in place, but now there's new gates. There's one right here. And then there's one over here that are centered on the temple. And, uh, there's a depiction of that right here. See right here. So this used to be just a wall, just like this wall right here at the bottom, right? Uh, it's like, it's as though this wall uh, just like extended like this and uh, you didn't have this kind of iron fencing. But now you have this and it is centered on the temple from both sides. Let's see, do I have another one? No, I don't. But you can see it right here. You see, this is on the north side. If you walk through here, you would be centered on the temple. So that's a change. So if the two guys that wrote this paper are right, then it may be because Christ is coming. We have more access to him. He's actually going to be here. Um, or I don't know. Uh, or it, it just may go along with um, how we're trying to get more and more focused on Christ and more and more focused on the temple. And uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, whatever you think, put it in the comments below. But that is a, a, an interesting change from the way it used to be. Okay, so anyway, however... There is still no access to the front of the temple from the street. The temple could have been placed where the tabernacle now stands, making the front of the temple easily accessible from Temple Square's main north-south pedestrian mall. Uh, remember that the temple was begun over 10 years before the tabernacle before the tabernacle was begun. Yeah, so what they could have done if just in case you didn't follow that, what they could have done is the temple could have been built right here instead, where the tabernacle is. And so you have this main uh, pedestrian walkway or mall or whatever you want to call it, and that would have gone right in front of the temple, but the temple was not placed there. Now, I have a separate theory why that may be. 
Um, I wasn't thinking about showing this, but uh, let's go to the Joseph Smith papers. Let's go over here. Um, uh, City of Zion Platt. I think that's how it... Okay, we want to look at the revised... Not that... Gosh dang it. Go back. Just do City Platt revised. Yeah, here we go. So uh, the revised plan, and I think that this still is the plan whenever the time comes to build New Jerusalem, is in the center. You'd have 24 temples, and uh, we have the names of the temples. It's it's here on the Joseph Smith papers. I'm not going to go over that right now. But the primary temple, the like the main temple, would be this temple right here, temple number 11. And Salt Lake City was somewhat based off of this plan, uh, the plan for the for New Jerusalem. And so if you look at this and then you look at Temple Square, essentially the place where the Salt Lake Temple is, um, is in the same location that the primary temple uh, would be in the New Jerusalem. It'd be on uh, the city block that's on the west side and then on the east side centered um, of that city block. So let's go back here. Okay, so here's uh, one block where you have the church administration building, Joseph Smith Memorial building, the church headquarters building, the Relief Society building. So you have this on this block on this side on the east. And then the western block uh, you have the Salt Lake Temple, the Tabernacle, uh, the guest buildings. They're not calling them visitor centers anymore. They're going to be called guest buildings, these two right here. Which, inter interestingly, they're in the shape of the, the church um, symbol. And then the entrances to the temple on the north. But anyway, you can see uh, that the Salt Lake Temple is in that position of the primary temple. And I think that that's why. I think that's the main reason why. I could be wrong, but okay, let's go back. Okay, so the temple actually turns its back on people entering Temple Square. Clearly, easy casual access for visitors was not the intention in positioning the temple on the square. The temple is further set off from visitors within the walls surrounding Temple Square by inner fences and walls. Yeah, because it used to be it doesn't look it doesn't look like it's like that anymore. But there was a wall and it's kind of hard to tell from this. Let me see if you can see it better over here. It doesn't look like you're going to have those walls anymore. Uh or or if these are walls, I don't know how high high up these go. But you can see that the temple is much more accessible now. Because you didn't have to, you didn't used to have these uh, stairs right here, or these stairs right here, or uh, this like walkway right here. It used to be gated off or like walled off. Uh, it would go like this, like the wall would go this way, and then it would turn and go this way. So you, ha it's almost like you had a temple square within within a temple square. Uh, but now it's opened up. Okay, but anyway. Um, even those that come to the temple, to temple square to attend the temple, do not directly enter the temple. They enter the temple annex, uh, through a small gate in the north wall of the square. The entrance into the, into the temple itself is via an underground passage coming from the north. Uh, one is reminded of the various courts that set off the temple of Solomon from the world. That temple was not only a holy city, it was, a, well, it was not only in a holy city, it was also approached through a series of courts uh, to which access was increasingly restricted. The walls around Temple Square and the somewhat serpentine entrance into the temple seem to be a reflection of the tradition that temples should be a sanctuary set off from the secular world. So if they're right, <laughs> excuse me, if they're right about that, if that was actually the intention of how Temple Square was laid out, then uh, it may be that as we approach the millennium, there's nothing to close your close yourself off from. There's no um, there's no more like secular world 
uh, like there is right now. So there's not a need for uh, defenses or uh, separation or things like that. Does that make sense? So they could be onto something with that. And it's interesting because the renovations have taken place after they wrote this paper. So that's, that's something interesting to think about. Um, so why does the temple face east, face east if the east doors are not for regular worshiper access? The dedicatory plaque on the east face, on the east face of the east central tower holds the answer. Well, again, I'm not, I'm not so sure when it comes to the plaque. We, we just talked about that. Um, it could be, it could be, um, Ultimately, the temple is not a house of man, for it is the it is the Lord's house. The eastward facing position of the temple on the square reinforces the millennia, millennialism of the gospel. Just as the east central tower welcomes the untrammeled light from the rising sun coming from the east, so it will welcome the Lord at the commencement of the millennium. Quote, but the Son of Man will come as the sign of the Son of, of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. End quote. So that's from Joseph Smith, and uh, we have a few different accounts of of this this uh, prophecy with these details about the sign of the Son of Man. He talks about the fact that the sign of the Son of Man is going to start out small, but it's going to get bigger and bigger until it's all in a blaze, and it's going to uh, go from east to west. So with that in mind, let's continue. This prophetic doctrine was reaffirmed in 1956. Quote, The Los Angeles Temple was the first in the 20th century to include an Angel Moroni statue on its 257-foot tower. Uh, architectural plans called for the angel to face southeast, as did the temple itself. President David O. McKay, however, insisted that the statue be turned to face due east. Uh, most, but not all, LDS temples face east, symbolic of the anticipated coming or second coming of Christ, which Jesus, compa- which Jesus compared to the dawning in the east of a new day. Uh, Matthew 24, 7. So I, I feel like that's probably a better argument uh, for the doors on the east side to be for Christ at his second coming. Not so much the plaque, but it could be. Uh, continuing, thus... The dedicatory plaque is not a casual sign. In one sense, it is an announcement to greet the Lord when he comes to his house at his second coming. The temple's, the temple's position facing the east, facing the east wall of Temple Square, reminds us that this is not our house, it is the Lord's. We go to the temple to be taught of him, to adjust our lives to the Lord in order to understand his ways. I like that. So, anyway, so that's pretty much it. You know, you just have this interesting thing with uh, the two, I guess you could say, entrances to the temple. Um, Yeah, and that's basically all all I can say about that. I I do feel like I can say that on some good authority that this is actually a thing. But um, suffice to say, you can see here that they do fit within the within the doors and the gateway and uh It's just a perfect image, you know, Christ walking through these doors at his second coming, your resurrected Christ. So, okay, well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.